Hello, everybody, and welcome to another spicy, blazing, uh, four alarm fire episode. Four alarm, five alarm fire. I yeah, I mean, how many alarms are there? It's that many. It's that many alarms. I think there's five. All right. Yeah, if I recall, <laughs> uh, you know, from my time, from your time as a as a as a firefighting professional, yeah, yeah, yeah firefighter. Um, red hot episode of the Chocolate Bros podcast. You're here with Brian and Adam. We are the co-owners, co-founders, along with one other gentleman of the wonderful chocolate company, Fortunato Chocolate. And All correct. Have- Everything you just said is absolutely correct. Check us out at www.fortunatochocolate.com. Mm-hmm. Fortunato is F-O-R-T-U-N-A-T-O. Sometimes people have trouble with it. So fortunatochocolate.com. All together, all lower space. No, no underscores, Adam. We don't, we don't have any underscores in there. Yeah, sm- yeah, no, smart to mention that. You know, we get a lot of people throwing in a an underscore sometimes and it just ruins mm-hmm. the, whole web, the whole web address. Oof, it just doesn't get you where you want to go. Yeah, let me say this, bro, because um, there's there's a there's a question to be answered. Mm-hmm. Why would a couple of guys like us who own a chocolate company even mm-hmm. do a podcast at all? And- well, they're right to question it. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> it's two, two, there's two tiers to this question. One is, right. where do we get off even thinking we should do a podcast? And the second is, why would you? And I would just want everybody to know, we just do this. Hopefully, maybe we don't succeed. But with the desire to hopefully just add a little something, a little more entertainment, a little more information, a little education, something that will hopefully enrich your interaction with our company and maybe help you enjoy the chocolate even a little bit more. Yeah, absolutely. Not only that, it's a great chance for us to just spend a little time talking to each other, riffing and having fun because we're a couple of goofy guys that like to make each other laugh. So there's that. And yeah, I mean, it's hopefully it, it's informative uh, and interesting to our, our um, you know, to our, our the people out there that are interested in hearing it. And, you know, the people that say that what may, what what gives you the idea that you could do it? I mean, podcasts are extremely democratic. There are a hundred, there's a hundred million of them out there. And so there's no, the question isn't, should we do it? The question is, does anybody care enough to listen? Uh, and the answer is very few people, but hey, we, we, <laughs> we, plug, we plug away because it's fun for us. And those people that do listen, hopefully are getting something valuable out of it. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. Yeah. And just to reiterate what I said, I know for, for my own personal motivation, I'm mm-hmm. just hoping that if you if you do business with our company, Fortunato Chocolate, and then you happen to listen to the podcast, maybe while you're eating the chocolate, it might just add a little layer of context. Yes. Or a little, uh, just a little something extra that we can give that will enhance the overall experience. It's like a drizzle of of it's like a drizzle of caramel over a delicious, you know, chocolate base. It just it's a little extra something, something that makes it just that much better. There you know? you go, bro. All right. I want to tell you a story, Brian. At the top here, right off the top. Oh, gosh, I want to hear this story. Of this sizzling hot episode of the Chocolate Bros. <laughs> I mean, there's only one way to start a sizzling hot episode, and that's with a story. So let's get into this. You're Adam, you know, if I think of you and I think, what is Adam? What defines Adam? He's a storyteller. Storyteller. I mean, that's what, the storyteller. Yeah. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Obviously. Yeah. Is he an accountant? Sure. Is he a father? Yes. Family man, husband, brother, son. He's all those things, but more than anything else storyteller and you know what defines you bro you're a rambling man (laughs) (laughs) i feel like there should be some kind of a every time you say that there should be like a whistling a song with some whistling in it that comes on or a train whistle something like that (laughs) can you do i can (laughs) wait this hot pod bro (laughs) (laughs) for those who can only hear this adam's attempting to do that classic like hand whistle thing but it's not it's not happening Anyways, forget it. Yeah. Forget it. <laughs> really I don't know how to edit this, so that's just gonna have to stay in. So that's right. We'll we'll go back and post and put and put a right. train whistle into that dead space. Now you're you're gonna be amazed by how this story leads into something having to do with chocolate. Okay. Uh, all right. You're a cat lover. I know that about you. That maybe if oh, you, the old cats if, and chocolate stereotype. It's such a trope out of you sure you want to do this. If you weren't a rambling <laughs> man, I'd define you as a cat lover. <laughs> father I mean, husband chocolate company entrepreneur all that cat lover right, above right. all of that uh, above all yes yeah so i have a couple of cats the outdoor cats mm-hmm. they never they've never set foot inside of our house except for when they were kittens and we had them living in a little kennel as soon as they were big enough we set them out and, and what is the rationale for them being purely outdoor cats we did i i personally don't like having animals in my house Okay. I don't like it. There's too much hair shedding. I don't like the odors. And my wife and I are both on the same page here. And my wife is Peruvian. So her view of, of cats 
is slightly different than how an American views cats. These are working cats. Right. We should mention that in the high Andes mountains of Peru, specifically in the area around Cajamarca and Celandine, the two towns that our two Peruvian wives are from, cats are not considered popular and are frankly looked upon with suspicion and outright disregard by most families. Yeah, the suspicion thing is pretty funny. Mm -hmm. um, so we we had chickens for a long time. Mm -hmm. We don't anymore. The kids promised they were going to take care of the chickens, and then they totally didn't, and we ended up ah, taking care of the chickens. Okay, well, you got to schedule another podcast on the yeah. unreliability of kids. Okay, that, but that's Come for on, kids. Sorry. Come yeah. on, kids, get it together. Yeah. Get get a job. I'm tired of paying so, for all your stuff, by the way. Uh, and we we live on a decent sized plot of land here, out mm -hmm. where our house is. Like forty acres, right? You got some corn, sorghum. Got some, got, some, got some buckwheat back there. Yeah, yeah. Isn't, sorghum's a popular African uh, grain, isn't it? Well, you're the farmer. You tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we import <laughs> sorghum from Ethiopia. Okay. Um, yeah. Nice. Somalia. Barley. Eastern, yeah. Eastern African mm -hmm. grain. Um, do you like to do you pearl your barley there, Adam? Or <laughs> yeah, we pearl the barley. <laughs> okay, nice. <laughs> yeah. So we had we had chickens, mm -hmm. and the chickens because the feed got on the ground. Mm -hmm. attracted rats yes and we started to have real might like a real field mouse and and rat problem mm -hmm. and some even started sneaking into the house on us if we left the door open unintentionally Those rats and mice are no respecters of closed doors that's for so sure so we got the outdoor cats mm -hmm. and the cats have done a tremendous job they are real hunters they're this excellent is the, hunters. the same reason that we always uh keep cats around uh, keep a few feral cats around our uh bean processing facility in campo yeah. It cuts the rodent population to basically zero. If you're a rodent and you can choose to go try to look for some food where there is a cat or isn't a cat, it's a no-brainer. This is why the, the phrase barn cat exists, because uh, from time immemorial, when people have needed to store agricultural products, they've kept cats around to keep the rodent population down. Right. So we, we have these two outdoor cats, they're brothers. We've had them for about five years. Mm -hmm. And I, I love them, man. Honestly, I... I didn't buy them for that. We didn't get them for that reason, but I have really come to appreciate them and like them. They are affectionate when I go outside to feed them. Okay. Stuff. I was going to, I was going to yeah, ask. Yeah. That. Yeah. They're cool. They, they they're are awesome. family members. They're just outdoor living family. They're just, they just outdoor living, working okay. cats and they are ferocious hunters. But if you and come hunters. around, if you go out into the back, they'll come around for some. Yeah. yeah I've, and I've come to realize that cats love attention. It's weird. Oh like, yeah. They yeah, really yeah. Crave. Except when they don't want it, and then they're like not into it. But these, since these are outdoor cats, and mm -hmm. we're not out there with them all the time, whenever we go outside, they're really looking for attention. And okay. I thought they'd really like me to stand near while they're eating. And this will feed into this story that I want to tell you. I know that they like me to keep guard for them while they're eating because there's other animals that come around. And when I'm around, they don't have to be on guard. They can mm -hmm. just sort of eat and, and feel secure and enjoy. Interesting. Their nice little yeah. synergy there. They take yeah. care of one thing and then you take care of the other thing. Yeah. yeah. So we we get a ton of raccoons coming around here. I don't oh, know. Yeah. You, yeah. Ooh, it's, it's they're everywhere. I mean, Pacific they're, Northwest they're, is heavy raccoon territory. PNW is prime raccoon territory. Prime. They're, they're around. Yeah. yeah. And so we, we leave the cat food out and our cats eat and then the raccoons come and then I have to sometimes chase away raccoons. And we get other cats coming around wanting to eat. Now, here's what I have noticed about my like really efficient hunting outdoor cats mm -hmm. who kill squirrels and kill birds. They, they kill other animals that are big. Like They're tough cats. Mm -hmm. They're outdoor cats. They live by their instincts. They know mm -hmm. how to survive. They rarely ever fight with other animals. Mm -hmm. They do not. And I know cats have a reputation for being territorial. Mm -hmm. But when other cats come around, I, I just watched this scene last night. This other cat, which is like a big, burly, orange cat who comes around sometimes. Mm -hmm. He came over and my two cats were just standing there. We're, we're sitting next to their food, sort of staring down this big orange cat. Mm -hmm. But they weren't getting all puffed up and growling the way cats do sometimes. Mm -hmm. They were totally chill, calm, just standing there, not, not uh, mm -hmm. posturing like they were going to attack and get into a fight. Mm -hmm. and the orange cat just stared at them and then eventually the orange cat realized like i'm probably not gonna be able to eat this food and just walked away but without a so, threat of violence yeah it was all calm it was chill but they didn't they didn't risk injury by getting by throwing themselves into a fight which i found so pretty interesting it, it's an interesting thing i mean so they live outdoors they don't they can't they don't really have a place to take refuge so they've had to learn 
how to come to an accommodation because I guarantee you they first off raccoons are vicious and a raccoon. So this is a, a big orange cat, but they yeah, do the same thing with raccoons. That's what I'm saying. They, raccoon uh, cats don't want to fight raccoons. Raccoons are vicious. Raccoons will take a dog out. Uh, I'm sure they've come across bobcats uh, before. I'm sure they have to deal with lots of different stuff from coyotes, all kinds of different stuff. And they've got to have an accommodation with all the stuff that's out there and coming around their area and they can't be fighting them all. They'll lose. So you're right. They've, they've figured out how to survive in a, in a semi, in a semi uh, uh, like rural context. Yeah. And I, and I've seen them just chilled out, just sitting there when raccoons, when raccoons come up and they don't even like run away from the raccoons. Mm -hmm. And you can see like the raccoon also doesn't want to get into a fight. If, if the cats will just let him let the raccoons come eat, come and eat the food. Mm -hmm. All those guys, all those guys can just be chilled out and they don't have to risk death trying to defend their right. territory. And by the way, those, cool. those, those raccoons live out, live outside your house too. And they yeah. know that there's a steady food supply. If everybody understands that there's a steady food supply, they don't really need to fight. So they've, they've all, they've all understood the basics. That's yeah. And all, and all mm -hmm. my life I've had indoor outdoor cats mm -hmm. who viciously protect their territory and get into fights and get scraped up and get cut up. But these mm -hmm. outdoor cats who have no other choice but to coexist, yeah, ha ha have found a way to live harmoniously with all of the other animals that are around there. Even though in this case they weren't going to let that orange cat eat the food, but all because sides, they, right, they don't have to. But raccoons they have to, cats yeah, they don't. Yeah, but all sides sort of sensed and realized that there didn't need to be a fight over it. It just was mm -hmm. what it was. Yeah, yeah, very yeah. interesting, very interesting. So, and that made me think of you, Brian. <laughs> so how does this tie into chocolate? Because okay, I'm, all right. So I, for some am reason, I the orange cat, or am I one of the brothers, or am I a raccoon? And this is no, you're the stuff. rat. <laughs> <laughs> we got run out of town. Yeah, <laughs> and we're no longer allowed to come around. No, Interesting. So, I'm a, I'm so, a peripheral player in this story. I, I, nah, yeah. Well, here's what got me thinking. Here's what got me thinking about you was just this idea of there's some territory where there's living beings. And then somebody like an outsider or somebody new comes in and how, mm -hmm. how does everybody respond to each other? Mm. And, and it got me thinking about what it was, what, what it was like for you as an American going out into a very remote Valley in Puerto Ciruelo and the district of Orango where we buy cacao mm -hmm. and you lived out there for 10 years, but what was it like in the very beginning showing up and trying to get people to work with you and trying to accommodate accommodate yourself and fit into a new environment where you were a total outsider, and you had to figure out how to how to win trust and and fit mm -hmm. yourself in. So yeah, so in that in that sense, I was, uh, I I was perceived by the locals. I, I there were many different perceptions of me by the people there in Puerto Cerrillo and Warango. Some saw me as a bobcat or even a mountain lion, and some saw me as a raccoon, and some saw me as another cat. And some probably did see me as a mouse. Um, and so perception is reality. So you have to be able to discern how people are, are perceiving you and then and then play off that or adapt to that. Um, you couldn't, it's very, it would be very difficult for any outsider of any sort of ilk, even for Peruvians from other places in Peru to just roll into Puerto Suelo and Warango and expect to just do business. Um, you need... For, for you to get off on the right foot, you need a, an introduction. And luckily enough, I had an introduction to the to the whole, to the region as a whole from Sarah Paredes, who was working at the um, at the agricultural office, part of the Ministry of Agriculture uh, there in the region. It had been around. It was a known factor uh, amongst mo you know, many, many, many of the people in that area. She was presenting me and providing some bona fides. So right off, I had uh, the door that opens the door. But that was the whole region, right? Not just not just Puerto Cerruelo. Right, and she, she presented me to Noé Vasquez, who has become my great friend uh, and whose house I stay in when I go there and whose kids are my godchildren. He's the president of the Cacao Growers Association. And Noé, I met in Hyen, and he made it clear that his association was interested in doing business. Um, and so Noe was able to be the local person from that town that presented me into that town and provided some shelter and some bona fides. And then on top of that, I had already been in Peru for five years, living, working and living and working with Peruvians and speaking Spanish. Uh, so I knew enough about Peru, generally Spanish and the culture to not 
to, to be able to, to, to show people that I could be accepted. Um, so it was a combination of those three factors, a, a presentation to the region, a presentation to the local people by a local person, and me knowing how to act um, when I first pulled in. And you kind of phased in, right? So first, first year in Hyann, which is the big city. Yeah, and, well, so and, first, and the first time in- It's kind of one place where you went out to buy right. cocoa beans. But at some point, you make the change where we're just setting up shop in Warango and you're moving there. That's so, right. And so before doing that, so, you know, I, I started in Cajamarca, an even bigger city of well over 100,000 people, a regional capital with people, both expats and people from other parts of Peru. So getting to know Peru, uh, improving my Spanish and getting to know the, the culture in a bigger, more accepting, more cosmopolitan city, although calling Cajamarca cosmopolitan is a bit of a stretch, but, but it's more, more cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan than a lot of other places. And then in Hyann, it's also a larger city, very few foreigners, but but still like larger, you, you're not causing a sensation by being in Hyann, really. And then going into uh, Ceruelo, I had local people with me, I was presented, and they all knew that I represented potential investment. And so when you represent potential investment, that also is a door opener and conversation starter. And it's a it's a tolerance builder, if not acceptance builder. Acceptance comes through work, but tolerance, they'll tolerate you if they think that you might invest and, and provide some jobs and income. So all that helps to open the door. And then at a base level for any person who's going into another, uh, uh, going outside their comfort zone and outside their domain and into someone else's domain and into a different place, a different culture, you just have to be culturally sensitive and you just have to know how to get on with people generally. And if you come in with an attitude of I'm better or I'm this or we're different or et cetera, then it's never going to work. So you just have to have a general orientation towards we're all mostly the same and the differences that set us up, the, the thing, the commonalities that we have are enough for us to get along. And the differences that we have are fun and not uh, 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 threatening and, and dangerous. Right. Yeah, actually, that that's a good point. And in particular, um, I know for sure, like in a place like Puerto Ceruelo, and it just happened to me when I was in the in the airport on my last trip to Peru. Mm -hmm. um, certain types of things that would be considered politically incorrect in the United States are mm -hmm. totally on the table in Peru. Yeah, so I know of many, but give me an example of what well, you're Well, so I'm just walking through the airport and there's just like an old Peruvian lady and she's just like, hey, gringo, what's up with you, man? <laughs> like, what are you yeah, doing right. here? Right <laughs> up in the airport at Cajamarca. And yeah. there's just this old Peruvian lady and that would just be just like, hey, white man, what are you doing out here? Like, what's yeah. your deal? And she just wanted me to explain myself it, it, for being a white e guy in her neighborhood. Yeah, it, it could even be more insulting than white guy. It could be sort of the equivalent of, hey, cracker or something like that, it, right? Hey, yeah. Cracker, but, you know, they call each other gordo. So it could also be like, yeah. hey, fat boy, what's up? Yeah, like, yeah, that's, hey, and that's hey, not a thing that yeah. would make you. It does not considered offensive whatsoever. Um, Correct. And so I just only mentioned that because you talked about having it be kind of fun, recognizing your differences. Well, and you have to, you have to have. Like, they're going to call, you, like they're going to call you out about why you're different. They're going to talk about it. Uh, you have to have a robust sense of self ridicule and be willing to laugh at how different you are and how awkward things are and be willing to accept almost everything with a laugh and a smile. That helps a lot. Knowing the language is absolutely fundamental. If you, if I didn't have good Spanish, it would have never happened. So now to take that next step. So yes, what I'm going Puerto Suelo were one place and we were working in different places. So I had that same experience 12 times you know, in different places, different areas that we were working with. And then when it came time to actually move to Puerto Ceruelo and Warango, we didn't just show up one day and say, hey, we're here, guys, we're moving in. No, we had, I had uh, lots of meetings with lots of people kind of taking the temperature. And also we had some public forums where we met with the, com the Campesino community and the Cacao Growers Association in large groups <clears throat> where I presented, talked about who I was, talked about what we wanted to accomplish, asked for people's input, listened a lot, took questions, to, went through a whole process of getting to know the people and presenting myself and being open and letting people see uh, and know what we were about um, and making sure they understood that it wasn't about us taking what's theirs. It's about us coming in to, have a, to create a partnership uh, that's going to lead to more income for them and assuring people that we weren't looking to start a mine. And Oh, because yeah, the mining thing was a very sensitive topic. It's just, it yeah. is a sensitive topic throughout all of Peru. Well, and I, I was coming from Cajamarca, where the vast majority of expats are in the mining business, and which is dominated by a mine, which we've talked about frequently on the show. Yeah. So let me ask you this. What do you think were some of the 
objections or other than other than the mine but what what like what were some of the initial objections that people had to doing business with us or believing you um especially being somebody different and being a newcomer like what what kept people from wanting to buy into what we were selling in the beginning i'd say the number one thing was more was not that they didn't <laughs> was nothing against us it was just that they had long-term relationships with people that were already buying their cacao Mm -hmm. And those relationships were sometimes family relationships uh, or, you know, close friendship relationships. Um, so it, it, in order to change that paradigm, you had to give people, you know, a good reason. And money is the is the most powerful contributing factor to that, too. But there's got to be more. So, um, you know, uh, stabil price stability, um, uh, volume, technical assistance. You have to offer some things that they're just not being offered by their current buyer, a uh, better price and more stuff, um, potentially jobs, potentially other investment in the area, things like that. Um, and so that, I mean, that we went out village by village, um, sat down with a group of eight or 10 people in that village, um, men and women, and had lunch and drank soda, which I hate. Soda, but I drank soda. Um, Coca-Cola? Coca-Cola, Inca-Cola, which I despise among uh, even more than any other <laughs> okay, soda. Tell, tell, tell people what Inca-Cola is for the listeners. Ah, okay, so starting... I remember my first ever cup of Inca-Cola, man. It's, ah, start, it's, per, it's, it's the Peruvian national uh, soda pop. It's uh, got a, a shocking, gross yellow color. It's bright neon yellow. And it's a, combi the it's a, it's a combination of bubble gum and pineapple and, and, and cough syrup. just just saying it makes me gag a little it's the grossest i i don't like coke i occasionally have a sprite occasionally you, you take pineapple you mm -hmm. take cough syrup mm -hmm. and you take some bubble gum you throw it in a blender mm -hmm. you add some soda water to it and yellow make it, and yellow make dye it, make it absolutely insufferably sweet so you're out there drinking Inca cola so you had to get out Reluctantly, there. Reluctantly, yes. So probably, bro, and correct me if I'm wrong, what you may what we may have initially considered to be the benefits, may, maybe morphed or modified over time as you went out and talked to people and heard what they actually wanted and what their actual real concerns are. Mm -hmm. Like the probably, probably wouldn't have been like so obvious on the service to know exactly what they needed to hear without doing all of those tours and talking to people and seeing it firsthand and hearing it, hearing it come out of their own mouth and building the trust and all that. Yeah. Well, okay. So, I mean, we've talked about it before. My whole mantra was what would Newmont do? I'll do the opposite. And so Newmont was the company that owned the big mine in Cajamarca. And the one thing that they never did. And then I always did was listen. So I would just say like, we're interested in, in doing a cacao project. And I've spoken to, you know, Noe and the president of the, and, and, and in an assembly, but, you know, I'm here to hear from you directly. You're a farmer. I'm a potential buyer of your crop. How was, how does it, what's your dream scenario? How would you like this to work? What do you need out of this? And just listening, just taking and not being, not being in a rush about it, going out, sitting down and saying, I'm here as long as you guys care to talk to me. I'm here to listen. What do you have to say? And just, you know, just it's some certain basic things I think some people have and some people don't just being able to walk into a room of people you don't know that are from a wildly different background that don't speak your native language and being able to comfortably look them in the eye, shake their hand, sit down with them and converse as if you, as if you belong there. Okay. It's just something I have. It's just something I can do. And some people cannot do that. And some people are born to do that. We both have it. Yes. We both have it. And I, it's hundred percent because of our childhoods. And we, Probably, had to learn, yeah. and we had to learn those skills. I know that. Mm -hmm. yeah. But dude, one of the classiest and easiest and most powerful ways uh, to just to, to easily win someone over is to just let them talk and to just listen to them yeah. and give them a sympathetic ear. And handshake like and said, a smile. Handshake and a smile. Let them know. Let them understand that you feel like you're equals and just hear them out. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And, and have environmental awareness. Like you said, if you're sitting out on a cacao farm and they've got an outhouse with no running water, like... And, and and they're they're cooking the, the meal over a wood burning stove and they've got a dirt floor and there's chickens rolling in. Don't comment they're, on it. Don't be goggle eyed about it. Oh have yeah, your, like have your own yeah, toilet exactly paper. Correct. Have have a little soap in your pocket and toilet paper. And there's there's water in every farm. 
and be willing to be willing to do your business in an outhouse and then have and have your own TP and then have a little soap, go over to the irrigation canal and wash your hands there in the muddy water. Who cares? It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah. And just and, don't, and then don't come back to the group. Don't like sit down, shake everybody's hand and then immediately sit down and put gel your hands. Like, yeah. you know, <laughs> it's, it's a it's a um, it's emotional intelligence. Mm hmm. And situational awareness and just understanding who you're around and how you have to how you have to act to make them feel comfortable. I think uh, the, 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 um, the cliche of the ugly American mm -hmm. is totally a non it's kind of like a non emotional intelligence, non listening sort of cliche. Like we just show up and want everything to be exactly as it is where we live. It's not even that we want everything. It's that Americans tend to assume that the way it is where they live wherever that may be is the what is the best and only way to do it and why wouldn't everybody do it that way it's a there's a certain when you live outside the u.s what you come to understand is that the u.s has a certain superiority complex and a certain entitlement based on having been on top for a long time you think that's uh, what it stems from absolutely and by the way certain cultures have certain things Peru has a kind of a massive inferiority complex. The U.S. has a massive superiority complex. Other countries have other massive complexes. Everybody's got their baggage, right? So before I ever got to Campo, I already understood Peruvians' baggage a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I also had been living outside the U.S. long enough to understand my baggage a little bit. And I was able to both tolerate and accept theirs and moderate my own to where we could meet at a level that was productive. And that's what it's all about. Yeah. So when, uh, how, like, how long did it take visiting cacao farms and going to these association meetings and ma making efforts to understand people's dreams and what they wanted? How long did that process take before people really started to buy into you as a stable force in the community who wasn't going anywhere, who they could trust, who it made sense to do business with, and who was, was like obviously providing benefits that were worth cutting off ties with their previous mm -hmm. business contacts? So if you if you think of any hundred people you know, there's probably there's a hundred different personalities and a hundred different opinions, and it's just the same with people in Campo. So the answer to your question is it's every person had has their own pace. Um, there's no one answer. You just keep doing it and doing it, doing it every every day you're there, every time they see you, every interaction you have with the guy who owns the bodega, with the gal who's running the restaurant, with the person who's uh, taking cars on the on the ferry across the river with the uh, mechanic who you see always working on uh, uh, motorcycles as you walk by and you say, hello, say hi to the people you buy your shower sandals from. You're just creating a presence in that community and becoming more and more accepted. So there's no one moment when it happens. But like how, 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 how long did it take you to reach like a critical mass before we had a nut week or we're buying enough cacao that we could actually make chocolate? Oh, uh, I mean, that happened pretty, I mean, before we invested in, before we, you know, started building our first MP in, in Puerto Ceruelo. Our, you know, like our first cacao processing, our first cacao processing facility in Puerto Ceruelo. Um, we already had an agreement with the, with the campesino community who owned the structure and we already had an agreement. These were signed paper agreements but you, with, so you're talking about with the Cacao Rice Growers Man. Association. Yeah. But we also had a signed agreement that was approved in an assembly of the Cacao Growers Association for anybody that cared to, to sell to us at a preferred price. Um, by being a signatory. So, I mean, we, before we made that move, we already had some, we already had agreements in place and, you know, those agreements are not legally binding. There's no, no way no, no, to no, force them, no but we, but we had, we had handshake agreements with dozens and dozens of farmers who were interested in making more money for their crop. Um, and also they were interested, you know, at a human level, they were, these are old trees. They've had them for a long time. In many cases, their father or grandfather had them. They were interested in this, in this crop being used to make great chocolate. They were interested in that. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, they, you know, they weren't really. The, 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 pri the pride of knowing that the crops yeah. that are native to their land were going to go into something special. Most of those farmers were aware that there's a more complete post-harvest process that can be done and better quality that can be brought out of those beans, but they didn't know how to do it and they didn't receive any money for trying. So they didn't try and they never figured, you know what I mean? It was just, was not in their self-interest to do it. So I think there was a sort of a latent, pride in a lot of people when we said look we want to really give these things a very complete fermentation etc and sell them into a fine and a fine and flavor um you know cacao chain and turn this into some world-class chocolate which eventually you're going to get to try that was very interesting to a lot of them very compelling let me ask you bro um I'm, you weren't just doing business there you're actually going and living there yes so there, there's a work day and then there's also something like your free time or personal time after the work day 
where you're not Brian, the guy who's buying cacao and processing cacao. You're just a dude who lives there mm -hmm. and you're not a robot. I think I feel safe saying that I've known you a long time. I, I am not. A robot. <laughs> <laughs> I've known you since before robots were like really a thing that people thought about. You're, yes. you're, you're pretty old. You've been around a long time. Mm -hmm. um, did you like, was it hard? Because everybody has ups and downs and it's happy and sad and so, sometimes angry or sometimes just want to be left the hell alone. Mm -hmm. um, did you feel like you had to wear a mask or project an image while you were in town? Or were you able to just like eventually be yourself and just live as a neighbor in that town and have fun and joke around and make friends and play soccer or do whatever, or were you always having to like be on guard and then project a company image while you were living there? It, it, it's both. So yeah, you, you you have to be authentic. So wearing a mask actually is not a great way to go. It's not, it, it, I don't think it works long-term unless you really commit to it, but that's, I'm not interested in living that way. So you have to be you. And so I, I have some rules for Campo survival that have kept me, you know, safe in Campo. Um, you need to be, you need to be open and friendly and accessible, but also you have to, you have to be guarded. Okay. So you're going to a place where you don't know anybody and you have to rely on the local population to keep you safe. All right. So start there. Um, so that means you have to be tight with the local population. So that means you have to be a known factor to people and, and, and relate to them positively on a human level. So it's what I said before saying hi to people, stopping in, giving your, you know, dollar living, not living ostentatiously living, walking around in sandals and shorts, like everyone else driving a cheap Chinese motorcycle, like everyone else. Um, if I came in and built a fancy house, and drove a fancy car, then it would have been alienating to everybody. So none of that, um, eat at the same place. Uh, don't, don't even, even when parts of the local culture aren't really to your liking, don't make a stink about it because it's not your culture. It's theirs. You're not trying to impose anything. I'm not a big fan of cockfights, uh, but they have is there, them. Is there still a ton of cockfighting? Yeah, there is. Yes, they yeah, have yeah. them. They have them. I got invited to them. I went to a couple at the beginning so people could see me and know me. Uh, did a little uh, a little relationship building with guys. And then I didn't go to them anymore because I don't care for them. I think it's cruel. It's not my scene. Uh, but I wasn't crusading against them. Uh, I have to accept that that's, an, uh, that's part of their culture and I can't change it. I should. It's not my job to change it. Um, I went and then I stopped going because it's not, I don't care to go to things like that, but I wasn't trying to pass a moral judgment on the, I mean, I might have a moral judgment. In fact, I do. I morally, I but judge you, fights you, to be it's wrong. Not really, you can't really express it because I have not won election as the judge as the moral judge in that town. So, yeah. you know, so it's not my place. Um, so, you know, there's, so there's that, but so I have Campo rules for survival and those Campo rules for survival are no religion. Just, I'm not a religious don't man. I don't talk about it. I don't get into it. I respect, I got a lot of sort of religious comments coming at me. for. And, to and, 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 the, and are the people on Campo very religious, Catholics? Some are, some aren't. It's just like anybody else, most yeah. are Catholic, but there are also um, also charismatic. Atheists, uh, yeah. No, I know, there's, I know atheists out there too. There's, there's, a, there's a, a community of Jehovah's Witnesses. There are Nazarene. There are what's called Israeli. I don't know what the translation of that would be. They're most predominantly Catholic. I got a lot of God bless you and a lot of things like that. And I said, I said what I would say to someone in the U.S. who said that. Thank you very much. I don't, I don't mind hearing it. I'm not religious, but I never got into it with anybody. I didn't talk about it. I didn't. It's just not my place. Uh, no politics. Didn't get involved in international or national politics. Occasionally, people would want to do a little U.S. bashing, um, and I would just sort of be sympathetic and say, yeah, yeah, we made a lot of mistakes, etc." But I just didn't want to go there. I didn't get into local politics. I didn't talk about national Peruvian politics. No politics, no religion, um, no hard partying. I'm a guy who likes to have a, a, a tipple from time to time, drink a little brewski. Um, have have a good time, but I never really, I, I, maybe in my in my 12 years of being heavily in Campo, I might have let loose twice. Yeah, and um, there's plenty of opportunities to get hammered out there. Oh, you could do it literally every day if you want. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I got invited to drink uh, a lot of the time. I would sit down and have a polite beer with people from time to time. Um, uh, well, you're leading, a team, you're leading a team down there and you want them to do quality work and be responsible and take pride. It's You can't really be a drunk and also 
right. lead, lead correctly. And it just, you're exposing yourself to danger. I can think of two times the whole time I was there that I kind of let loose and I was uh, with people that I, that I trusted in a, in a context that I thought was okay to do that. Once I did it uh, with my, with the, the, uh, with the, with the team, with the cacao team, okay. uh, I, I brought a bunch of, uh, of like crap per- Peruvian craft beers when that was just starting to be a thing. And so that they could try them. And, and we had a little team party. Um, and once I was asked to be a judge, for the Miss Puerto Ceruelo contest at the Semana Turistica, the tourism week, uh, when the river's down in the summer and they, there's a beach and they set up this whole week long big party in Puerto Ceruelo. And they asked me, and on that night, uh, with my, with my good friend and our operations manager, Oscar Ayala and some other team members and a couple of farmers that I know, we had a little bit of a good time at the, uh, at the, uh, at the beach on the river. And those are the two times I can ever remember, but my, by and large, stay away from, from partying. And the other one, and this one's, this one was really important and it's important on several levels. No, like almost no interaction with, with women, with females of any, of any type. Now, one, I'm a married faithful man and that's a thing. And and people that are listening might not understand that in Peru, a man is almost expected to be at some level of infidelity. It's very, very common. It's very, it's very common. Yeah. It's yeah. And so that's very, uh, in, in, I even remember having a, maybe you were there, but I, I had a conversation with, with one of the guys who worked in our, in our processing facility and the, the, the topic came up of, of being faithful to our, to our wives. And he, he was just kind of like, like, why, <laughs> why, why would you, I, yeah. every, everybody in Campo assumed that I had a girlfriend in Hyann and everybody in Hyann assumed I had a girlfriend in Campo and everybody in Cajamarca assumed I had various girlfriends everywhere. But the truth is I did none of that. And the reason is first I'm a married guy. Uh, secondly, it's a small town and there's a very exact balance between the men and the women there. And everybody's everybody's got their eye on everybody else. And yeah. there's no way for a guy who's comparatively wealthy, exotic, um, and, and, and just privileged in general to come in and start throwing his weight around in that scene. It can only cause trouble. Um, and it's just a matter of respect. And, um, I just never wanted anything to be misinterpreted. And, you know, my wife and kids came to Campo from time to time, and I didn't ever want to be in the situation. Either so in that, I mean, Campo. so in that case, you're talking about not, you're not looking, you're not flirting. I don't even not, say you're hi. Not, you're not being caught alone. Maybe I don't even, nod, just a I nod, don't even, that's about it. Not even a nod. I might say hi to women older than me who are running a bodega that I shop at, but like young girls that, that are there would sometimes try to have a conversation with me. I just wouldn't do it. I'd say have good afternoon and keep moving. I never, ever did had anything. I never wanted to be, have any woman of any age or aspect come up to me and be like, Oh, Brian in front of anybody else to where it could even be a concept that anything was going on. That's because it can, it can only lead to trouble. That, like, sometimes I was even outright, outright rudely non-communicative to, to, to women in Campo because I didn't want anything to be interpreted as interest. That's a pretty interesting topic. And you want to know something, dude? I do that in the, I do that pretty much here in the United States too. Mm-hmm. I try to be extremely, extremely um, focused on, 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 on not sending any weird signals or mixed messages to any women whatsoever because i'm a married man and um you were talking about religion before and stuff i've read the bible a couple of times Mm -hmm. like even the wisest dudes in the world like king david and king solomon in the bible Mm -hmm. who 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 were famous worldwide for how smart and disciplined and wise they were found the chink in their armor by letting their eyes drift and getting caught getting caught up in some kind of a weird web with with women who were not their wives man that's like the easiest thing in the world for a dude to just get totally messed up and it can mess up your whole business it can mess up your life that's like being being careful about that out in campo was yeah. such a smart it, it, good thing yeah. to do. and I'm, I'm far from perfect and i've had my troubles in my life but i managed to avoid any trouble like that the one thing that ever happened that related to that was so Sunday is market day. We've talked about this uh, in Puerto Ceruelo. And after about 2 p.m., things start to get a little drunk and rowdy in Puerto Ceruelo. 
uh, on on Sundays uh, in the afternoon. A lot of farmers are coming down from their from the higher altitudes where stuff is grown down in there. Uh, there's a row of cantinas and bars that kind of goes off on Sunday. Some professional ladies uh, come into town from other places and play their. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah professional ladies sex workers we can just say it um yeah. and so they're there i would so after having lunch on a sunday i would always go to my house close the door close the windows watch soccer work out work on the computer not whatever be I out. Did, not be read out a book and not be out and i just didn't want to be in part of any of that whatsoever at all because that's when if there were any resentments or anything was gonna was gonna happen that was when it would happen one time one time some young man, I think he was the son of a farmer, got it in his head that I was messing around with a girl that he was interested in, or that I was interested in a girl that he was interested in. And he got apparently got drunk down at one of those cantinas, and he heard that I lived somewhere near the Plaza de Armas of Puerto Ceruelo, but he didn't know where. And he came up to, the, to, that, to that cement park there in the, uh, the that Plaza de Armas of Puerto Ceruelo, and he started and he was shouting. He was like, gringo. And he was he was shouting and he was saying, come out here, I'll fight you. And he was shouting for me to go out and fight him. But he didn't know where I lived. He didn't know which house was mine. And nobody was like, nobody went out to, to, to intervene with him or tell him where I lived or tell him to go away or anything. Like that. And I just kind of checked him. I went up on the roof and I remember just kind of carefully looking at him and trying to see if he was like figured out which house it was. Even if he knew which house it was, he couldn't get in. I had the place closed up and I just, he just for like 40 minutes. He was How'd there. you find out that that was the reason why he was out there? I asked around. Well, I knew he was looking for me because he was I shouting. Knew, but, but how'd you know that, that was the reason why he was out there looking for you? I suspected it had to be something like that. And then I asked it's always around. Good. A friend of a friend had been down there at the bar with him and told him, nah, you're crazy. But the guy got a, a little bit too much beer in his belly and he came up looking for me. And he and he was shouting and 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 scraping around and he was kind of he would sit down and slump down on a bench and he'd be like, Gringo! And he was, <laughs> he was shouting for me. He's like, Gringo, man, man, they got the boy a lot of Yeah, just that, just that one time that he forgot all about it after that. Yeah, yeah, and, and then that was he sobered up and that was the last yeah. of it. I I don't know who he is or how what he thought or anything. Hey man, I, I, re I remember Jorge. You know the guy who the the guy who used to be our manager and Jorge Bermeo, very good friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. Told me one day on a Sunday he was out and about, and a guy pulled a knife on him. Yeah, and it was his wife. It was his wife's ex boyfriend who mm -hmm. had been drinking mm -hmm. and felt felt that Jorge had stole that stole his woman from him and wanted to wanted to make things right. And I've, I've had nothing, people. Nothing ended up happening, but I've had dude, people... that, that 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 man woman thing. Yeah. Is the root of so much bull crap in the that, world. That man. jealousy so and that anger. Yeah. I've had people, I've had people with machetes out in their hands be in a fairly threatening stance towards me. Um, and I've had knives pulled on me uh, in in Campo and in Hyann. And uh you have to have a you have to have a calming way. Well, in that case, were they trying to rob were they you. trying to rob you or are they trying to settle a score? I, were they just trying to let you know that you better watch yourself or like, what was the context? Yeah, for it can be any of that, but, uh, but, but the, the, the point is that stuff's going on. And if it's, if it's ever going to actually happen, what you just said is correct. It's going to be when someone's got a little too much beer in them. It's going to be when it's about their, their uh, when it's about their emotions, typically about someone of the opposite sex. And so I just scrupulously avoided all that and it worked. I was able to really avoid that, that's, dude, that's complications. Such a smart, that's such a smart thing, man. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, you if you're not smart, if you're, I mean, you kind of have to be. You're, you 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 have to create an island and be on it. But no man is an island, so you have to create an island and be on it. But be also aware that you know the island depends on the water and the wind and the so you know. So it, it's a it's a balancing act, and I guess I'm just constitutionally set up to be able to pull off that balancing act. And then there's other balancing acts that I absolutely cannot pull off. Um, and that, you know, that's just who I am. So everybody has their specialty and that seems to have been mine. Did you, did you have any other rules other than no politics, no religion and no women, no politics, religion, women, or booze. And no uh, booze. Yeah. Very little booze. That's right. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main, I do. That goes a long way. Honestly. Um, yeah. That, that goes a long way. Uh, 
in in a lot of in a lot of circumstances. I mean, by the way, if though, yeah, this, I, I, you know, those those almost like good rules for like having a good friendship too. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. It, I, so I, I've told you before, like if someone asks for a ride and you have a seat available, always give them the ride. Yeah, out in camp, um, yeah. Yeah, try try to almost never say no when people are asking you for help monetarily or 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 for any other reason. Um, consider everybody your equal. Um, don't refuse a meal if it's offered in you know uh, uh, from the kindness of someone's heart. Accept the generosity of people that want hey, to be that, generous that, to you. That that don't refuse a meal thing mm -hmm. is is can really endear you to people all over yeah. the world here in the United States. If someone has cooked, if someone has cooked you something with great love and 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 affection, mm -hmm. and they want to offer it to you as as a sign of friendship or a sign of their appreciation to you, eating that whole meal, regardless of it's if it's your type of thing, mm -hmm. not turning your nose up at food that that that's a great lesson that I learned from my time in Peru. Mm -hmm. Peruvians do not take kindly to be, to having somebody turn their nose up at food. It is that's really right. not a good thing to do. That's right. If you if you if if you if you really don't want to drink and you know so walking around Puerto Cerrillo, I get sort of hailed to come over and join groups of guys yeah. drinking a lot of the time, and if I know them and I can see that they're not like too far gone, I'll go over and have a glass and socialize for a couple minutes and then beg off. And sometimes I'll say, other times I would say, oh, I'm taking medicine. I'm taking medicine and I can't have any alcohol. The doctor said no alcohol. I would you know. Uh, they, I would they, would like they accept that? that? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They might not understand it completely, but I wasn't just saying no. Yeah. I give them a reason why, or, uh, I got my car is waiting to go. I've got to make it to my bus in high end, et cetera. So sometimes I would beg off and other times just so that people could occasionally see that I'm, I'm open to it. I don't think I'm better than them. I would go have a glass of beer, um, and hang back for five or 10 minutes with a group of guys, um, and let people see that, you know, that I'm a social guy, that I'm not like a robot, like you're saying, but I just not much of a drinker. Uh, and so you start to get a reputation um, where people know that you're, you know, that people know kind of where you're at in the scheme of things. And then it's fine. So yeah. it probably took me a couple of years for people to really understand where I was at in the scheme of things. Um, and after that, it was pretty easy to just get into a routine. So I, we're going to sign off here in a second, but I just want to say something. You just, based on what you just said, I, I just... I realized something very fundamental about the way that we were raised. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really have never even thought about it before, but ju you just said it. We were really, and this is what I think this is something that really prepared us to do business in Peru. Mm -hmm. I was, I was brought up to never really think I'm better than anybody. Mm -hmm. Well, in your case, it's absolutely valid. Yeah. You're, 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 you're not better than anybody. Else. Well, that's fine. I, I don't think I am either. I like no, one of no. the worst things in the world is to actually like not be better than other people, but you think yeah. you are, but like, that's the worst. Yeah. You, know, you know what I'm saying? Like the thing is, if you have some self-awareness, you realize you're better at some things than other people. Yeah, and you're, yeah, but, you're better than actual bad, evil people. I, I don't, I don't know. In terms of a human, that. human person, you have to understand that we're all just humans doing our best. I know. But even, even when I know I could say this in your case, and I could say that in my case too, though, even though when you are clearly superior at something, Mm -hmm. you're you are a person who's not willing to really be you don't really like to be the star of the show or the center of attention you you will do it if you have to in order to push push a project forward if that's what's required of you yes but no matter how much you've achieved you really don't like you know you like to get celebrated or patted on the back too much you just yeah. like to go about your business and i'm the same way i I, yeah. I don't do a good job of dwelling on accomplishments i always have like moving right on to the very next thing I, yeah, I'd say we, neither of us are inordinately humble, but we're also just not attention seeking. And yeah. so that and, and so that that goes a long way. But yeah, I think just, you know, it's strange that we ended up that way because mom's like an act, a, an actress, a ham. She loves the attention. Mm -hmm. But neither one of us is really. Not really, not really like looking to be celebrated at all. No, for no any not reason. At all. and that, yeah. that really is helpful. Yeah, you're right. And something I, I guess the, the main thing, at least in my upbringing, I moved around a lot and I had to really learn how to like integrate myself into into new groups. Uh, I mean, I lived in uh, three or four different places in San Diego and then I moved to Idaho and then I moved to Fresno and then I moved to Orange County and then I was in Long Beach and then I was in the army. Uh, and so I was constantly, you know, by the time I was 20 years old, I had lived in 
15 places and had to get myself set up in a bunch of new groups and find my and find my spot, my position in all of those new schools and all those new social lives. Yeah. And so I learned a certain flexibility and I learned a certain way of integrating myself that has stood me in good stead ever since. Yeah, somehow we were both always kind of outsiders. I don't know. Yeah. I, I was I was a white kid in a, in a predominantly non-white neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So I was a I was an outsider where I lived. Mm-hmm. But then I went to a magnet school in another city. So mm-hmm. I had the I had the culture of the neighborhood that I was in, but then I was going to this upper class magnet school where I totally did not fit in. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It's yeah, I've, I've always sort of bounced around from one place to another where I didn't I didn't fit in at all. So just n- not fitting in and figuring out how how to adapt with that just runs deep in us. You know, we're just yeah somehow always outsiders trying to make ourselves fit into wherever we are. You know, it's weird. Yeah, exactly. And I guess there's a certain mentality of you could. There are some people that just kind of go anywhere and don't really feel like an outsider. Like I, I actually thrive on being like, I, I do too. when I've done, when I've done cacao work in Belize or Vietnam or uh, Ecuador or Bolivia, when I've been contracted to go do genetic testing or um, when I've done um, uh, consulting for a cacao project in the Philippines, um, I have no problem being the only white guy. I have no I know, problem I, I getting the getting those stairs you get them because you're you're tall not just not just a white guy but super tall uh to the point of ridiculousness um <laughs> and, and the, you have to be able to at some point just accept the stairs and accept the the awkwardness if you you know if you really want to get on in life and do adventurous stuff you have to just embrace the awkward that's the main thing is you're yeah, gonna yeah. you're gonna be you're going to bump up against a bunch of just physical discomfort and weird, awkward situations. And if you can just like laugh and give this one goes in the awkward story book, I'm going to, I'm going to live on this one for years. That will really get you through a lot of, of, of weird, sketchy, funny, just unpredictable situations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, bro. Yeah, no, I, on this, on my last trip to Peru, I almost, I almost feel more comfortable as being the only white guy in, in a place where there's no other white guys than I do in a room full of white guys. Uh, yeah, I it's know. Really, it's a strange thing. Like I, I almost feel mo- yeah much more comfortable being around people who are not like me than mm-hmm. a bunch of people who are like me. I don't know how, how it happens like that, but <laughs> yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing. It seems to run in our psyche. So it it's, does, it does. It it's just something our- fun. It has to be do with our upbringing and maybe it's just, maybe part of it's just nature as all, as well. Like we share, half our dna and maybe that's just in our dna for whatever reason yeah there you go all right bro well hey um i'm gonna go ahead and wrap it up you got any final words you want to share any final Uh, i I think you gave a great primer on on how to be a foreigner overseas i mean that's a there's some really good lessons in that yeah i mean i would just say like to all you americans out there that are listening to this get out there go get your passport go Go visit some places and get off the beaten track and go walk around, try to learn a few words, use your Google Translate or whatever you use to do that. Go eat local food in small restaurants, suffer the diarrhea if you have to, but just enjoy the like, get off the beaten path, do that. Go go out and see the world because it's a marvelous place with lots of amazing adventures and lots of amazing people and even and also some weird, scary, sketchy situations. But as you get through them, uh, you'll look back on it with great fondness. So I'd say get out there. Um, and the other thing I want to say is thank you to all the people that come to our stores, that uh, go to fortunatochocolate.com and buy our stuff online. We really appreciate it. Um, some people uh, may know who listen to this podcast in that order that we've switched over from the uh, the U.S. Postal Service to UPS, the United Parcel Service. We switched from uh, blue to brown in terms of our package delivery, and we're having a much better result, much less uh, problems customer service wide with wise with worth my package with missed deliveries, etc. So we're so pleased um, that we're able to get the stuff out to people. Um, a little more reliably. And we just, you know, from the bottom of my heart, thank you to everybody that listens, that buys, that's interested, um, that is is in any way uh, related to our project. It's all about you guys um, getting on board with what we're doing and why we're doing it. And we couldn't be more appreciative. So just a great big thank yeah, you. I do. I second that. Um, we're buying cacao from about 500 small cacao farms in Northern Peru. We're a small family business. We employ in the United States, that like, between 10 and 15 
full-time employees in addition to you know uh, us working for the company and all of that is made possible by our wonderful customers who believe in us and help us spread the word um uh, uh, piling on top of, or adding on to what you said about just getting out there and going and do it i know one thing that i've learned being the son of an entrepreneur you know we're both we're both children of entrepreneurs you're allowed to just do whatever you want like no one's going to stop you if yeah. you've got a dream that you want to go see someplace there's the only person who's going to stop you from doing that is you. That's you took right. up snow, you took up snowboarding in your in your fifties. Like, I did. If you're in your fifties and you want to snowboard, or if you're in your seventies and you want to go to India, like the only Do person it. the only Do person it. stopping you from doing that is is your own sort of limit like limitations of how you see yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Do it intelligently, but do it. You can do it. And Nike, Nike got it right. Just do yeah, it. Just do it. Um, I will just give a couple more updates before we sign off, because since you're talking about UPS and USPS, um, we're about like a week away from launching our new word of mouth program, which is going to replace our marketing budget. So we will no longer be spending money with Facebook and Instagram to promote. Mm -hmm. Rather, we're going to be putting that money back into the pockets of our customers and sending a matching amount down to um, down to Peru for for aid and relief and supporting the community down there. So for all the people who are thinking about participating in that program, it's going to be up and running soon. And we just thank you for helping us spread the word. And um, also I have prototypes here, Brian, you've already tasted the almond butter with dark chocolate and almond butter with the 47%. I have the peanut butter versions here and they mm. are so good, dude. I can't wait to try them. So yeah. delicious. We are, we're, we're putting together products that are a little bit more friendly for shipping in the heat. Um, that Let me just say for 30 seconds on, on that. Uh, we don't ship with thermal protective packaging because it's environmentally destructive. Uh, all that stuff ends up in the uh, in the um, in the landfill, uh, and we won't do that to the planet. And it's also not that effective. We use UPS ground shipping and gel packs and so forth. They really don't. Um, they don't they don't work over the course of ground shipping. And now that we're not just selling big blocks of very durable chocolate, the products that we have would not aren't really that shippable within thermal sleeves and and with gel packs that just be destroyed when they get there either by the heat or by the gel the weight of the gel packs. So we don't do that. So we know that a lot of you can't get our products right now, and we apologize for that. But there are some good reasons why we don't do thermal packaging. Um, so we're looking for products that don't require it, and these nut butters are going to be part of them. Oh, I, I tried the uh, I've, so far I've tried the almond butter with forty seven percent dark milk and sixty eight percent dark, and I can vouch for two things: a, they're absolutely delicious, and b, they got warm in my car and and kind of melty, and then resolidified, and I ate them, and they 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 stand up to the heat quite well. So they're really yeah they're yeah really and, the, and the peanut butters we did like and they were just liquid, and I put them in the fridge, and they firmed right up. And I'm talking yes. creamy, delicious. Mm -hmm. So if you need your Fortunato fix during the summer, these nut butters are going to be a great way to go. I mean, they are delicious, delicious. Absolutely. So those are a couple of things that are that are coming up. And um, we just thank you all from the bottom of our hearts. You know, I, I, we, can't, we can't say it enough. Uh, everything we do is is to serve to serve our customers and act as a conduit between the cacao farmers in Peru and the folks who enjoy the chocolate. Absolutely. In fact, let me, before we go out and last thing, let me just call out one customer because she is such a great customer of ours and such a great person. Uh, our, our, uh, I don't know if she listens to this podcast, our, our customer Yvette, I won't say her last name in Iwa, Hawaii. And she, we had a, a, an issue where we couldn't ship to Hawaii for a little bit um, because of our new contract with UPS. And we had to figure out uh, how to do non mainland shipping under the terms of our contract. And Yvette was distraught because we couldn't ship. And so she got in touch with me directly and I was able to uh, play, uh, place a custom order for her and push through shipping using a different shipping agency. We're not really set up to do that, but I did it just for Yvette because she's such a super client. Yvette, if you're out there, man, I cannot express enough how much we appreciate your, uh, your, your business and how much we appreciate your passion for our products. And we just love uh, being affiliated uh, uh, with you and all our dear customers. So again, yeah. thank you all. All right, bro. So why don't you go ahead and sign us off with the Fortunato jingle. Fortunato yum. All right, everybody. Woo I hit it. I did it. Going out hot. Coming in. Going out hot. Oh, yeah. All right, everybody. Mm. Have a good one. Bye.